It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the coach. Today uh, we have a question from Mark. Mark says, I wonder if you may have time to look into the origin of the nunchucks. I can find no evidence of their historical use. I've heard them described as once being rice flails, horse bridle bits, or even noisemakers for night watchmen. I am not convinced by any of those explanations. A rice flail without one longer handle will break your back, and there are far better noisemakers. I suspect the horse bit explanation is just grasping at straws. I used to read about them in martial arts books and magazines as a child, and now I read about them online, but I can find nothing historical to even suggest they were used as weapons. I suspect they were invented for movies. I think I would be better equipped using a 24-inch stick for self-defense than two 12-inch sticks joined with a chain. I realize that I may be wrong. Warning, this subject has the potential to upset even more fanboys than daring to question the infallible might of Bruce Lee. Oh boy, well, let's, let's upset some fanboys. Now, I've heard all those same rumors that you heard about the Okinawa and Kobudo weapons and how they started as farming tools that the poor farmers used to fight off the samurai. And that, that's a bunch of nonsense. Go check out our friend Jesse Enkamp. He's got an excellent video essay all about this topic and how these weapons were <laughs> originally invented as weapons. The, take the Sai, for example. I don't have nunchucks on hand, but I do have do have a set of Sai. This is a traditional Okinawan Kubudo weapon. Right? Kubudo is it's a weapon art of the Sai, the staff, the boat oar. Sometimes the nunchaku is included in the pantheon of Kubudo weapons. And there are a lot of myths about these. The myth says the Sai was intended as, as a rake or a hoe where you poke holes in the soil to plant your rice in it. That's that's just patently not true. It's absurd. This weapon originated in China, not in Japan, not in Okinawa. It originated in China and was carried to Okinawa by not peasants, not farmers, but highly literate and fairly wealthy individuals who brought weapons with them when they left. So you can find a number of different variations of this particular weapon in China, as well as Okinawa, Japan, etc. So it's not even original from Okinawa. And it's definitely not a farming tool. I mean, you, you could co-opt this and, and figuratively or literally beat your swords into plowshares and use it for, for that if you wanted to. But yeah, let's get back to the nunchucks for a minute. Is the nunchuck a historical weapon? I don't know. Can it be used as a weapon? Yeah, it, it can. Can it be used as an effective weapon? Absolutely. Do most people teach it as an effective weapon? No. <laughs> no, they don't. If you want to see one of the best videos on using the nunchuck as a practical weapon, go check out the late, great punch professor. May he rest in peace. He has an exceptional video on how to use the nunchuck with two hands, a two-on-one grip. Most people use one hand and, you know, they do tricking and juggling with those things. And that looks cool, looks great in the movies, but that is probably the worst application of using that as a practical weapon. If you want to use it as a practical weapon, a two-on-one grip is the best way to go. So, again, check out the Punch Professor. Again, love that dude. We miss you. Professor, we miss you. I got all emotional there for a minute, but... Uh, yeah, why else would we have a nunchuck, you know, two 12-inch sticks instead of one 24-inch stick, as you mentioned? For a very, very simple reason. Portability. You can stick it in your pocket. You can wear it on your belt. You can put it under a coat. It's easier to hide, easier to carry around with you. Easier to sneak into public places than carrying around a big stick with you. That's about it. Is it a superior weapon? Eh. The superior weapon is the one you're better at using. So, there's a lot to be said about portable weapons. I mean, what do I have here? I'll check it out. It's, it's a set of brass knuckles. 
This is very portable. Is it a highly effective weapon? I mean, there are arguably more effective weapons than this, but you can conceal this in a pocket. You can have it on your fist as it's in your pocket, and then, <laughs> surprise, not that I'm recommending you do that, but there's a lot to be said about concealed and portable weapons. These ones? <laughs> I don't think I could get away with carrying these around on my belt in public. But the nunchuck, yeah, you could do that. Next question. Our next question comes from Al Stone, who says, Have you ever found a self-defense video or encountered a self-defense lesson where you actually thought they pretty much hit the nail on the head and all the moves were legit? Or would you say they've been heavily flawed every time? This was in response to one of my videos on MMA fighters try women's self-defense. If you haven't seen that, I know a lot of you have subscribed to this channel specifically to follow that series. But if you're new to the channel and you've never seen one, I have a whole playlist on my channel, MMA Fighters Try Women's Self-Defense, where we test out some pretty questionable women's self-defense techniques against the ultimate litmus test. Mild resistance. In other words, a guy just standing there not cooperating. That's it. Not fighting back, just not cooperating. Now, if you're Fighting techniques don't hold up against a guy who just simply isn't cooperating and isn't even fighting back. That's a pretty good idea that it's not going to work very well when the guy does fight back. And so, a lot of people have sent me comments saying, you are overly critical of the self-defense industry. No, the self-defense industry does not get enough criticism. It's bad. It's all bad. You asked me, have I ever seen a self-defense video where I was like, oh, all the techniques are good? Well, sure. But techniques are not self-defense. Fighting techniques are not self-defense. I can show you all kinds of videos on fighting techniques that are good and solid and well-taught and well-explained and will give you the best possible chance of winning in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation. And that's still not self-defense. And that's still not a good self-defense video. Surprised? Well, you shouldn't be if you've watched this channel for any meaningful amount of time, because that's not what self-defense is. Self-defense is a legal term to justify violent action that would otherwise be illegal. It's get yourself a lawyer, man. It is defend yourself in a court of law. Argue about that all you want in the comments. It won't change the fact that that's true. And the self-defense industry, the reason it's all awful, the reason it's all bad, is that it's a bunch of fear mongers capitalizing on your fear, capitalizing on the fact that you are afraid of dying and bodily harm. And they want to use that fear against you to get you to give them money. Because they have the answers. Look, only in my system will we teach you the, the one surefire method that works on the streets as opposed to, you know, all those losers and hypocrites who only know combat sports that work with pillows on your hands and on soft padded mats in a controlled environment with a referee and... You don't know the difference between the streets and the ring or the cage and... It's exhausting to listen to that crap. It's absolutely exhausting to listen to that crap. I get so many comments every day, hundreds of comments every day, and I... I used to read every single one of them very carefully, word for word, and now if if a comment starts with, you don't understand the difference between the streets and the cage, <laughs> gag me with a spoon, man. I just, I just automatically filter that crap out now. It's skip, skip, next one. But yeah, the self-defense industry is terrible. It's terrible. People who run gyms under the premise of offering self-defense courses, for the most part, are charlatans. And there are some well-meaning folks out there who offer what they call self-defense because nobody knows what that means anymore. 
and in a society where words mean whatever the heck you want them to mean, they don't mean anything anymore. So, man, I give up with self-defense. Who cares? Just learn how to fight, man. Next question. Our next question comes from Tren Bear, who says, Hey, Ramsey Dewey in Shanghai, China. That's that's where I am. and That is my name. Hey, Tren Bear over there on in the internet. How you doing, man? He says, My new kickboxing coach teaches us low kicks, which are basically snap kicks, and hitting with the instep instead of the shin. What do you think about this? I think that as soon as somebody checks your instep on their shin, that's going to be the end of the fight. And if your kickboxing coach doesn't believe that, spar with him. And when he throws one of those snap kicks with his instep instead of his shin, check it and see what happens. And yeah, it's not going to end well. Why? Because your foot is a bunch of tiny small bones. Your shin is a set of much bigger, stronger bones. And the small, tiny bones of the feet, when met with a shin check, will result in serious injury. Even a shin, when met with a proper shin check with force and weight behind it, can snap in two. So you want to give yourself the highest likelihood of success as possible. Now, does that mean you cannot ever throw snap kicks with the instep? No, not, not at all. I throw snap kicks with the instep all the, all the time, generally liver kicks and head kicks. Although I would prefer the shin for a head kick, because when you do land on the head, it's generally this hard bony stuff as opposed to the neck, the soft stuff. Even with the neck, throw the shin so the foot wraps around the back and taps them on the back of the head. That's one of the best ways to throw a head kick. <sighs> Man, go check out the tutorial. I've got it up on my channel with Jawad Mahmoudi on the ghost kick. It is one of the best ways to set up a head kick that your opponent can't see, comes in the blind spot, shin wraps around the side of the neck, foot wraps around the back. Beautiful technique. But as far as leg kicks goes, kicking the leg with the instep, that's going to be seriously risky for you more so than your opponent. Next question. Ooh, this next comment... It's got some questions in it. They look like rhetorical questions. Oh, no, it's it's a religious argument. Okay, cool. Let's get into this. Looks like it's a, uh, a re response to one of my previous videos where I said, God speaks the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Kirill says, um, no, he doesn't. He said Adam and Eve would die if they tasted of the forbidden fruit. They did not. Uh, correction, Kirill. Let's open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Yeah, he died. And so will you. So get your house in order, friend. Next question. Legendary Masamun says, Hey, Ramsey, question for you. I've been having trouble... A troubling time lately with myself, I've always loved martial arts as a kid, but I've always been socially awkward meeting new people. I'm a father of two, I'm 32, and I'm worried I'm going to pass these traits on to my children. I still would like to join a martial arts gym, but the fear of being in a crowd just always puts me off. My daughter's turning three, so in the next couple of years, I'd be looking to join her in a BJJ school, but I feel like I will have to take that leap first to inspire her. That's a good plan. I don't know, man. I've been dealing with this for most of my life. Maybe an inspirational video of your take on all this will help me take control of this hindrance in my life. Thanks, man. Love the videos. So you want to take a martial arts class, but it's socially awkward, right? The hardest part about going to any martial arts class, it's not the training, which is often, you know, hard. Makes you sweat, makes you tired. It's just getting in the door. It's that social anxiety of, oh, strangers are going to look at me and think things. But you know what those strangers at that martial arts school are going to think? They're going to think, cool, a new friend, a new training partner, especially the coach. Man, that coach is going to want you there. Why? Because it helps his business. Because it's... Uh, the martial arts industry, the product is not just the gym. 
It's not just the amenities, the mats, the equipment, the heavy bags, the ring, the cage, whatever they have there that looks nice and is helpful and productive for people to train with. It's the people. That is the biggest asset any gym has. And so any coach worth his salt is going to see everybody who walks in that door as inherently valuable. They want you there, if for nothing else, for their own selfish interests. But let's assume... Let's assume that you have a human being with a heart running that gym. He wants you there because he wants to help you. He wants to help you learn martial arts. So, that people there, this is your potential team. This is a group of people. I, I kind of hate this expression. How a lot of people are like, at our gym, we're like a family. Because... Uh, it's not what a family is. A family is sacred to me. A family is a different thing. But I understand what they mean. Like, we're a very close-knit group of friends. We like each other. We love each other. We, we help each other out. We're glad to see each other when we come. So just understand that you're not going to walk into a group of enemies. You're not walking into a group of people who will always be strangers and weirdos to you. You are joining a group of like-minded people who also love martial arts and want to train just like you and probably felt exactly the same way that you did before you walked in. So, bite the bullet, step one foot in front of that gym, be incredibly brave for just about five seconds or as, lo as long as it takes to put one foot in front of the other until it gets you in that door. Next question. Ryan wants to know, could you do a video on strategies to win amateur fights versus strategies to win pro fights? To which I said this, number one, understand the rules. Many amateur shows use different rules than pro fights. Not all, but some. So you need to understand what those rules are in order to understand which sport you are training for specifically. I linked him to a video I did a number of years ago with my friend Angelo. He was training for an amateur fight in Japan where... On the ground, you're only allowed to strike the body and not the head. And otherwise, the rules are very similar to pro MMA, except the rounds, I think, were shorter and they didn't allow heel hooks or something like that. So we sparred under that specific rule set to get ready for his fight. Now, Ryan, in response, says, thanks. I'll take a look at that video. I was thinking more along the lines of pacing, specifically the short game in an amateur bout versus the long game in a professional bout. So I think what we're talking about here is three minute rounds versus five minute rounds or something like that. That's usually what it is if there's a difference in the timing of the rounds. So that's not uncommon to have three minute rounds in amateur MMA. And what that does is it creates a greater sense of urgency on one end on the defensive end, but on the offensive end, it creates an opportunity to stall more efficiently and more effectively. I'll give you an example. If you are a substantially better wrestler than your opponent, and the rounds are three minutes long, you might get the first takedown within the first minute, and then you can just hold on to the guy and squish him on the floor for the rest of the round, and you're, you're probably going to win. If the judges know what they're doing, what they're looking at, they are going to award you that round. And if you do the same thing the next round, take the guy down and hold him down for a couple minutes, you're going to win. So you can win a whole amateur career doing that. Just take the guy down, pin him, hold him, squish him a little bit. And yeah, three minutes when you're starting out seems like a long time, but it's, it's not. Not really. Especially if you're working for a finish. To hold somebody down, eh, that, that's different. But working for a finish, a knockout, a TKO, a submission, it's not a whole lot of time to work with. Now, if you have two more minutes on the clock and, let's say, more competent fighters, this gets a little more tricky. A five-minute round in a cage with the unified rules of mixed martial arts favors the striker as opposed to the grappler. This shocks a lot of people. A shorter round 
tends to favor a grappler. A much longer round favors a grappler, but a five-minute round favors a striker. Here's why. It takes an average in professional fights, not amateurs, but professionals, of two minutes to bring the fight to the ground. That leaves a maximum of three minutes to fight on the ground. On average, at least once per round, the downed fighter will get back up to his feet, meaning it may take you another two minutes to get the guy on the ground. If a fighter is able to stand up quickly, often the judges will not score the takedown as effective grappling. If you are able to keep your opponent on the ground and hold him there and keep him there and control him for a meaningful amount of time, the judges generally will score it as effective grappling. Remember, MMA fights are judged based on three parameters, effective striking, effective grappling, and effective aggressiveness or ring or cage control. Effective striking is pretty straightforward, whether or not you can hit the other guy and whether or not those strikes do damage. Effective grappling is whether or not you are able to dictate and control position. If you can get the takedown and keep the guy on the ground for a meaningful amount of time. If you can get the takedown and inflict damage on the guy for a meaningful amount of time. Damage, duration, and domination is what the judges are looking at there. So, you have to be, well, obviously more strategic in a professional fight. In a longer round, you have to have a plan B. You can do a whole amateur career with three-minute rounds if you're a pretty good wrestler just by taking the guy down, squishing him, and just keeping him down without inflicting a great deal of damage. Think about George St. Pierre through much of his career. He did that with professionals because his MMA wrestling, if you will, was that good. And in amateur MMA, we often see huge skill disparities between guys who, say, were a state wrestling champion and guys who do a little bit of BJJ or something like that. And the state wrestling champion is just going to squash the other dude. And whether he does damage or not, he's probably going to win most of the time. So yeah, in those short rounds, work your wrestling, work your takedowns, how does that translate to professional MMA when, you, when and if you make that transition? Then you are going to have that tool set of being able to dictate where the fight takes place, whether you want it on the ground, on your feet, etc. So, amateur MMA, even though you don't get paid for it, it's a good idea to do some amateur fights. Why? Your first 10 fights are going to suck, so you might as well get them out of the way when they don't go on your permanent record. Next question. The next question comes from Alejandro, who said, who would be the winner if there was a tournament, a UFC one-style tournament between Jean-Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, Bruce Lee, Jet Li, Tony Jaw, Scott Atkins, Jason Statham, and Donnie Yen? What do you think of this, Ramsey? <sighs> okay, let's go to the neighborhood of make-believe for a little bit and conceptualize what would happen if these martial arts action movie stars actually fought in a UFC 1 style tournament. So, looking back on the rules of the UFC 1 tournament, no weight classes, no time limits, no gloves, two ways to win, submission or knockout, and nothing else. There were two rules, but the fight wouldn't even stop if those rules were violated. They would simply deduct part of the fighter's purse. No biting and no eye gouging. Everything else is 100% okay. The fights take place in an octagonal shaped cage with a wrestling mat surface. And yeah, you guys know the story, right? Right. So who would win? Now this is a single elimination tournament, so we'll just pair up these... Uh, Fighters, action stars, whatever we want to call them, as you have listed them. So the first fight would be Van Damme versus Steven Seagal. Steven Seagal has a pretty big size and weight advantage here. And let's just assume that we're taking each of these guys in their physical prime. right? We're not talking about, say, modern Steven Seagal, who's a little bit girthy around the midsection and, and kind of old, or Van Damme. How old is Van Damme now? Like 300 years old? 
Yeah, he's, he's still in great shape for being a senior citizen, but, uh, yeah, let's, let's just assume they're all in their physical prime, right? Van Damme, he had some full-contact karate experience, but this isn't full-contact karate. This is the UFC, right? Seagal, did he have any actual fight experience? I don't know. He talks a big game, but did he actually have a big game? Uh... He's an Aikido guy, so I think what would end up happening, this fight, Van Damme versus Seagal, they'd probably circle each other a little bit, Van Damme would throw out some snap kicks, and Seagal would probably get frustrated and rush in and try for like a clothesline or something, they'd tangle up, and Seagal being the bigger man would probably end up on top and, and squish Van Dam a little bit. That's probably what would happen. So I would give this first round to Steven Seagal. I, I hate to say it, but I would just because of sheer size. Having seen how UFC one played out, that's that's generally how it worked. Anyway, next la next match: Bruce Lee versus Jet Li. Two kung fu legends. Jet Li, man. Hmm. Did he have any real fighting experience? As far as I know, no. But his wushu forms were amazing, and his fight choreography, absolutely incredible. You know, just an absolute stud when it comes to fight choreography and movement. Bruce Lee, his fight choreography was much more grounded in reality. His movements were much more simple and straightforward. His philosophy of filmmaking was to try to show a much more honest expression of self, an honest expression of martial arts, try to make people see what a fight really looked like in film as opposed to f just fancy flying wushu movements, people literally flying through the air like the wuxia films of old. But could he fight? Now his fanboys obviously think that Bruce Lee was invincible, indestructible. I love Bruce Lee. I think he was probably a, at least a halfway decent fighter, but... We really don't know how good he was. We know he was physically strong. We have a little bit of footage of him sparring with a couple of his students, which is a lot more than we can say about Jet Li. Now, both of these men similar in size, as far as I'm aware. I'm going to give this one to Bruce Lee because he did have at least a couple of fights which, um, which we... We could say we're real. He had a, a, uh, a boxing match as a teenager. A one-round, two-minute boxing match. He won the decision on that. I know people romanticize that and call him the, the champion of Hong Kong or some nonsense like that. I made a whole video on that. It was a one-round, two-minute exhibition. And he won that one on points. It wasn't some crazy thing. And you look at the pictures, they're throwing wild haymakers. But the point is, he at least knew what... It felt like to get punched in the face, and he knew what what it was like to stand in a ring in front of an audience and experience, you know, all the nerves that go with that. I don't think, I don't know if Jet Li's ever done that. So that alone, that alone would tip the scales in Bruce Lee's favor. Next, Tony Jaw and Scott Atkins. You know, I've seen most of Tony Jaw's movies. I've never seen one of Scott Atkins' movies. I don't know a lot about him. I have seen some clips of his fight choreography, and both of these men are really exceptional at doing really cool-looking fight choreography. They both have some of the most incredible-looking, flying, kicking stuff ever put to film, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, I think... I don't know their size. Scott Atkins looks bigger. He looks a lot bigger than Tony Jaw, but I, I don't know. Um... I heard recently that Tony Jaw, I don't have proof of this or footage of this, but I heard that Tony Jaw has done some Muay Thai fights, not, a, not an extensive amount of them, something like five or six fights. So because of that, I would give the nod to Tony Jaw, but they're probably going to hurt each other quite a bit in this fight. Probably the same thing with Bruce Lee and Jet Li. It's probably going to be mostly punching. So, the first three matches, so far we have Van Damme's, um, 
Bruce Lee and Tony Jaw, they're coming out of this first round kind of beat up. Next, we have Jason Statham and Donnie Yen. And Jason Statham is kind of an outlier in this group because he is best known as an actor rather than a martial artist. I mean, I, I guess he's a martial artist. If you've seen The Transporter, you, you, you understand, well, this guy obviously trains, or at least trained a lot to make these fight scenes look cool, but he's not the career martial artist like all the other guys on this list. But he was a athlete before he ever started acting. Well, specifically, a diver. Yeah, the dude was a diver, a professional diver, before he got into acting. How much crossover does that have into martial arts? I mean, he's very physically fit. He can obviously punch and kick and do these things on screen and make them look very cool. And I love The Transporter. That's one of my favorite action movies of all time. And again, Jason Statham's not even a martial arts guy, if you will. Not a career martial artist, and yet he made one of the coolest action martial arts films ever. But he's facing off against Donnie Yen, and Donnie Yen is, man, he's one of those guys, man. He's one of those guys who is an absolute muscle mimic, and on film, he can make it look like he knows any martial art. You look at him in Ip Man, and you would think, this guy is, this guy, his Wing Chun is incredible, even though before that film, I don't believe he'd actually studied Wing Chun at all. But in preparation for the role, he studied it, and he was able to mimic the movement very, very well. Now, Donnie Yen, as well as being a movie martial artist, is a real-life martial artist. He has studied all kinds of wushu forms, but additionally judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which um, I'm not sure what his current rank was. A couple years ago, everybody on the internet was like, he's a BJJ purple belt. I have trained with some members of Donnie's team, and they make it a point to go out there and, and train and learn everything they can about martial arts, so... Donnie is the opposite of ignorant when it comes to different styles of martial arts. But can he fight? Ooh. Can he fight? So we have two guys who are both physically fit. They're both physical specimens. They both look cool on film, but can they fight? Well, Donnie has at least a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is young enough where that still means something. So I'm going to give this one to Donnie Yen. He's going to beat Jason Statham via rear naked choke in this fight. And he's probably going to come out of this fairly unscathed. So, the next round, we have Steven Seagal against Bruce Lee. <laughs> And you're going to hate me for what I'm about to say. They are going to engage. Probably Bruce is going to throw out some snappy kicks. And and Seagal's probably going to throw out some snappy kicks of his own. You know, those, those front kicks that he taught to Anderson Silva. And they're going to clinch up. And Bruce is going to try an Osotogari. But uh, his Osotogari is not good. It's not. I mean... You're going to hate me for this, but look at his sparring footage with his students, the way he set that up. That's a bad setup for an Osotogari. He's going to try that on Steven Seagal because his students just always gave it to him. And he's just going to assume this is going to work. Seagal is like twice Bruce's size at least. And in this specific position, just met with, with superior weight... Bruce is going to be the one getting taken down. Seagal is going to collapse on him, squish him with his weight, and it's not going to be pretty after that. Sorry to say, Bruce fanboys, but Seagal beast beats Bruce Lee in this fight. I know. I know. You, you're going to write angry comments, and you are going to say, No, Bruce would have kicked out his kneecaps, and they would have exploded, and he would have done a flying sidekick, and he, he would have d rolled into a rolling knee bar and done some crazy jujitsu and an Iminari roll to a heel hook, and... No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. He would have got squashed by a much, much bigger dude as soon as they clinched up, which they would have. So, next, we have Tony Jaw, who is competing against Donnie Yen. Okay, so we, essentially we've got Muay Thai versus... 
a guy whose known actual combat sports experience is jujitsu, but is well versed in all kinds of other movements. But as far as his real fight experience that we know of, it's jujitsu. So, effectively, what we've got here is striker versus grappler. This one could go either way, it really could. Oh. I could see Tony Jaw getting a knockout. I could see Donnie Yen surprising Tony Jaw. I could see I could see Donnie using his purple belt level jujitsu to take down Tony and and submit him all kinds of different ways. This could go either way. It could. Hmm. I I can't choose, man. I can't choose. Part of me wants to say, you know, Donnie because of jujitsu and all that and all, all of the all of the nerds who've never trained in BJJ are gonna be like, you're you're just being a BJJ fanboy because uh, Muay Thai striking, and it's mixed martial arts. It's mo not Muay Thai, so let's let's give it to Donnie. But he's gonna get hurt. He's gonna take some damage this round. So next we have a slightly damaged Donnie Yen going up against a slightly damaged Steven Seagal. <sighs> Steven Seagal, who by, by his girth has managed to crush his previous two opponents. And the Bruce Lee fanboys are still mad at me for insinuating that Steven Seagal could possibly ever in any universe beat Bruce Lee. But he's facing off with Donnie Yen. And Donnie has seen Stephen's two fights, and Stephen has seen Donnie's two fights. Donnie doesn't want to get into a stupid clinch with Stephen and allow him to just fall on him and crush him to death, and Stephen doesn't want to give up a leg and get taken down and get Donnie on his back and succumb to a rear naked choke. And so they keep a little distance between each other. There's a little bit of fainting. And then they engage. And I'm just going to put it out there. Donnie's the better grappler. As soon as they engage, Donnie is going to get under, probably with a duck under, probably with an arm drag, get behind Steven Seagal, jump on his back, strangle him. Steven's going to thrash about. He's probably going to jump on his back, trying to use his his tremendous girth to crush Donnie, but by that time, the blood will have been cut off from his carotid arteries. It won't get to the brain, and he will be either tapping or napping. And so, in the end, your winner of the ultimate Hollywood action star fighting championships, we got Donnie Yen. Am I biased in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Next question. Our last question comes from We Are So Predictable. Whoa, this is from three years ago. Sorry for the late answer, man. He says, Hi, Ramsey. Apart from proving that potatoes are capable of filming video, your old video titled Rubber Guard New York to Triangle Choke to Teepee shows that you once dabbled in the dark art of the rubber guard. And I sure did. And how, man. That, that was like my whole guard game back in the day. But he goes on to say, I don't think I've ever seen even the briefest of forays into the rubber guard in any of your more recent videos. I was hoping that you might be able to tell me why this is. Is it because you prefer to flow roll and avoid stagnating in the rubber guard to keep things moving? Is it because you've decided that rubber guard doesn't work as well for you personally? Is it because you've decided that rubber guard has some major problems or weaknesses? Is it because you use it all the time and I'm an unobservant doofus? Is it because of something I didn't think of? Is it frustrating when people like me give you a list of potential answers instead of just letting you answer? You know, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with a lot of these potential answers, to be honest. Um, and that's a very observant thing. Yeah, yeah, I don't use the rubber guard nearly as often as I used to. Sometimes I pull it off the shelf. But like I said, I used to use and abuse the rubber guard ad nauseum when I was competing in professional fights. That was my go-to thing. When somebody got on top, if they got the takedown, and I was in the guard bottom position, rubber guard, trap the arm, and then work for a submission from there. I liked it because it limited their striking options. 
not very many people knew what rubber guard was back then, and so it was like the secret weapon, the secret technique that nobody knew and nobody knew how to shut down back then. But times have changed, and I've changed. So, yeah, man, way back then, it, it really was my go-to movement. Now, you asked, is it because you decided the rubber guard doesn't work as well for you personally? No, not at all. To this day, I am still amazing at rubber guard. I am. My rubber guard is good. I won't even be humble about it. It's good. <sighs> is it my go-to move anymore? Will you see it a lot in my technique videos and my sparring videos? No. Why? I'll tell you why. <sighs> I used it and I abused it to the, to the point that it, that it became a crutch. It became a crutch that was holding me back. Holding me back from learning other things to do on the ground, specifically the most imperative things to do from the guard in an MMA fight. Number one, stand up. Number two, sweep, get on top if you were unable to stand up, create the space to sweep. And number three, work for a submission if neither of those things are possible. And in that specific order. Now, the rubber guard ties you into a very specific game plan and a very predictable one at that. As I said before, back then, it was like the secret weapon nobody knew about. Now, everybody knows about the rubber guard. Everybody who's been doing jujitsu for a meaningful amount of time. And so, it doesn't really confuse and surprise people anymore. Back then, yeah, man. It was shocking what surprised people. But... Yeah, honestly, it was a crutch just holding me back from learning jujitsu. So I put it on the shelf for a while and forced myself not to use it, not to go back to my strongest point of the guard so that I could develop the weak parts of my game to make the weak things strong. Because that's how you get rid of the weaknesses. That's how you become a capable athlete and fighter. So you said, is it because you've decided the rubber guard has some major problems or weaknesses? Yeah, there are two major problems and weaknesses with the rubber guard. Uh, number one, it locks you into the bottom game. It does. And it, it locks you into the bottom game with a very, a very predictable set of options. So as I said before, in MMA... Uh, when you're in the guard, your priority, your priority should be number one, stand up, number two, sweep or a reversal, and number three, submission being a distant third option if you are not able to do those things. Rubber guard locks you into a submission or failure game on the bottom. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I've got this cool sweep option from rubber guard, but you might notice that when you go for that sweep, you have to essentially untie that knot that is your rubber guard before you can sweep the guy. So, yeah, man, that's, that's pretty much it. Is it worth learning? Uh, yes, absolutely. You need to know it. You should know it. Does that mean you have to use it all the time? No. Learn all the options. Learn the weapons that will be used against you so they will not prevail against you. That doesn't mean you have to embrace them and use them yourself but you got to know what they are. Because what you don't know, what you can't see, is what's going to get you. Thanks for watching. Now get out there and train.